Thank you for tuning in to Hill Country Fellowship's audio podcast. We hope you're encouraged and inspired as you listen today. For more information, visit us online at hcfburnett.org. So we're wrapping up our series, um, These Are My People. And after I'm done with the message, uh, when we go into a a song, we're going to have communion uh, during our our singing time afterwards, and Pastor Rusty um, will, will lead us into that communion time. Um, so if you're watching online, you're listening on K-Bay, get your communion elements and, and join with us later on uh, as we remember the most amazing day ever. But with this, we're looking at what we as a people, Hill Country Fellowship, how God's uniquely designed us, crafted us, what He's calling us into. We've been, right, we shared our core values a few weeks ago, and, um, and today we're going to really hyper-focus on our mission. Um, and, and here's the, the cool thing about any good Jesus-following, Bible-believing church, that mission statement, those core values could go with any of them, right? Because they're based in here and on the, the person of Jesus uh, and, and, and the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but for us, you know, there's a specific thing that he's, he's doing in us and from us. Um, and so these are things we're talking about during this series that they really apply to any believer, uh, but, but we're hyper-focusing on what God's ha- God has for us, what makes us different, uh, why we are dependent on one another, uh, how we're meant to thrive, and then today looking at, at what it means to go. Whether it's across the, the world, in October, uh, I'm going with a team to Cameroon. We're going to work with Ernest uh, and that amazing ministry over there, and, and we're going to get down to Mexico. And we have people going to Camp Zephyr. We have uh, 400 kids coming here uh, at the end of June for camp. So there's lots of ways to go in missions, and there's lots of ways to go to your neighbor, go to, uh, to volunteer, to, to go to somebody in need and, and minister. Uh, and so today, our big idea is our mission statement, to lead people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus. And we're going to unpack that a little bit today, uh, uh, a little bit more in the fall, and unpack it every day of our lives as we, as we follow Jesus Today we're going to be looking at all that God has for us here that's also for there, eternity, our heavenly home where our real citizenship lies because our goal is always to live on mission. So, so we, we have all that God gives us here and we're living on mission, but it's really as we, we ramp up towards eternity, we want to see as many people as possible Go to heaven with us. Can you imagine how cool it would be if everyone you know, like from this point on, say, say you, you've messed up before today, but you know, and maybe you didn't tell somebody about Jesus or whatever it might be, who knows. Imagine every person you meet for the rest of your breathing life here on planet Earth, you see them in heaven. All because you just said, I'm going to live on mission. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to love them, I'm going to show grace, and I'm going to be an example. And I'm going to pray for them until they say yes. I was talking about it this week, I, I don't know who we were talking, I think it was me and Susie and maybe Rusty, and I was talking about Linda Ravenhill, who was a pastor of mine when I was young and famous evangelist, and, and, and then he moved away to Tyler, uh, nobody knows why, but he did, uh, and um, well, from Seguin, I guess I could see why, from here you wouldn't want to leave, but, but I remember when I was in college and I had had about a year and a half of bad Southwest Texas living, because uh, I lived for all the wrong reasons, uh, and and I got radically transformed, and I called Pastor Raven because I knew I needed to get out, uh, and I needed to go, and so I was going to a discipleship training school. Where's Karis? Wherever she is, what, what? She's going to do a DTS with YWAM, uh, and I was like, I need to get out. I need to go somewhere where God can really have some time with me, and I called Pastor Raven Hill, and I was telling him the good news, and he goes, oh, good. I can stop praying for you. God told me to pray for you until you finally decided to follow him, and that's been a long time. I'm done. I'm like, you don't have to stop praying for me. He's, no, that's my mission. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, but we need to keep praying for people that we are challenging and, 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 and telling them about Jesus and loving them on purpose for Jesus and, and, and presenting them the gospel and, and, and showing them who Jesus really is, not what the world says or what they believe wrongly. But when you tell somebody, if they say no, you may have to quit because they may, you know, not want you in their face anymore, but you don't have to quit when it comes to prayer. Keep championing them before the living God, the throne of heaven, because who knows how long it's going to take. 
that for someone's life, it, it may be a decade you pray for them. I think Leonard prayed for me for, I think it was 11 or 12 years he prayed for me. And I remember when he, when he said it, he's like, I have been praying for you, and he named three others, my cousin and, uh, and, and two of my really close friends, and, and my cousin was the only one left. He's like, well, Trey's the only one left that I have to pray for. That boy needs help. And I was like, you're right. Uh, he's worse than me. Um, but we're looking at, at our, our mission today and what it means to lead people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus in the midst of everything. It hadn't been a very joyful week in the life of Texas, or it hasn't been a very happy week in the life of Texas, but there's still joy in the midst of it all because joy is a character of God. It's a character trait of Him, and it doesn't ride the waves of circumstances and, and situations. In Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29, Paul's writing, um, and he's telling us how Jesus holds everything together and then how we're to live on mission for that. And he's writing it from prison. So I think whenever somebody's writing us something that's big and, and powerful, and then we go, wow, they're sitting in prison writing this. Maybe I should pay a little more attention. It's not like me, you know, in, in the study with the AC blasting uh, while I'm, you know, eating bluebell ice cream and, and drinking iced tea. He's in prison. And he writes this, I want you to know, I'm reading the message version, I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. I would say, amen, <laughs> that's just me. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of that suffering. When I became a servant in this church, I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift, God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. The mystery, in verse 26 he says, has been kept in the dark a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out. Regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing, the mystery in a nutshell is this. Christ is in you, so therefore you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That's the substance of our message, Paul says. And, and God wants everyone to know it. So this mystery is now not a mystery. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a profound, in such, in, we teach in a spirit of profound common sense so we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ. Now, he's not really that basic, but he's saying it's not man-made rules added to things. No more, no less. It's Jesus. That's what I'm working so hard day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy, the tireless intensity that God so generously gives me. You see, to Paul, everything he goes through, what he's saying to us here, everything he goes through in this life is a great, joyous privilege where he gets to identify with Jesus, the sufferings, and, and then take so many opportunities that, that come his way to tell about Jesus, whether it's in prison or before authorities or or at a, at a church, or wherever he is. He's like, I get so many opportunities. When I live on mission, I'm always, I always have something to do. That's what Paul's saying. And it's eternal what I have to do. Not just, you know, stuff to, to keep me busy, or, or stuff that, you know, makes me, you know, feel like, uh, you know, I need to finish to kick my feet up. He's like, I've got, I'm busy for the kingdom always. And Paul here, he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm fulfilling my responsibility of delivering this mystery, this secret to everyone. Everyone is forgiven. It used to be a secret. It used to be an unknown until Jesus came along, walked on earth, and then he died after a, a sinless life. He, he died on the cross for our sins. Everyone's forgiven. Everyone ever is forgiven. Now, you have to accept it in order to be saved. But hell, as sad as it is, will be populated with human beings who are forgiven but never repented. Everyone is wanted by God. You ever been in a situation where you weren't wanted? Last one picked. Uh, somebody like you're the one bothering your family. 
uh, you just, you know, you, you didn't fit in in the crowd that you wanted, like, nobody really seemed, it seemed like someone, nobody wanted you. God wants everyone. Everyone's invited into God's family. He wants only sons and daughters. No orphans, no, no servants, no slaves. He wants sons and daughters who can look at Jesus and say, that's my brother, literally my brother. And, and Paul's saying, hey, at one time it was, it was hard to figure out or to know or to understand this secret or this mystery, depending on what version you read. But now it's fully available to everyone. And when Paul talks here, he's talking plural. He's talking to us together. He's talking to the plural you, us, we, our. We need each other to grow and to become like Jesus. I mean, each of us is called and equipped by God, but we, but we have to be accompanied by others in this journey. We cannot make it on our own. I have to individually choose Jesus. I can't corporately, like, y'all choose him, and I like y'all, so I'm saved. It doesn't happen that way. I individually choose, but then I'm instantly a part of a community. I, I, I'm in community. It's all the gospel is filled with, from the Old Testament to the new. It's all about community. It's all about belonging to a church family, a church body, who are absolutely perfect and will never fail you at all, ever. No! You'll fail people and people will fail you. You'll fail leadership and leadership will fail you. It, it happens. We're, we're perfectly imperfect, so we bring that in. We're being made perfect while we are perfect. We're in process you know, and, and I always want somebody else's process to be a lot quicker and for everyone to have patience with me. But we're still called into this together. The only time that we are a body as a church is when we're together. You cannot be a body by yourself. It'd be like telling your thumb to be the body, uh, telling your toe to be your body. It's, just, it's one part. The Bible's very clear about that. It's not like rocket science to figure that out. We know that, but then the Bible even goes into that for us, that it's a conglomeration of saved people in process while God looks at them and he says, those are my perfect people. Now let's go and perfect them together. That hope of glory that Paul talks about, most of your versions will read, uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Jesus in you and in the life of every believer. And that hope of glory can save everyone. Think about it right now. Think of the person that you comes to mind when you think of the person farthest from Jesus that you know. The most, the, the most distant from God right now that you know. For whatever reason, they are distant. Think of them. God can save that person and God wants to save that person. Our lives lived on mission for Jesus can literally change someone else's destiny. I mean, that's an amazing thing. Your life consistently lived for Jesus and for others can change their life forever, can save everyone, change everything, change where they end their lives uh, as far as forever, which isn't really an end, it's, it's just the beginning, but like we end here and we move on to eternity. That's living in a way that thrives, like, like Jeremy and Kevin talked about last week. We don't just survive this life. We're not put here and saved to survive. We're put here to thrive because we're plugged into Jesus who is life. So we live on mission. We never settle. And at the same time, you're being turned into the image of Jesus. So we've been asking the question, what's God saying to you? Each week, as you read your word, as you pray, what's God saying to you? to do or to be a part of or, or to, to stop doing, to stop being a part of, to move into. What's God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? What's God saying to you and, and what are you going to do about it? In Isaiah chapter 43, God's talking to, to his people and he's, he's trying to get them to see, hey, what, what happened to you in the past to get you to this place cannot have ownership over your life. You have to move beyond that. It doesn't mean you forget and pretend it didn't exist. You, you deal with it so you're free, so it doesn't have any hold on you, but, but you cannot live there. You can't languish 
in the pain or the hardship or the horror of your past or what people did to you. And he's, he's trying to explain to them, I, I've got something new. God wants his people to discover his new thing for them. In Isaiah 43, verse 16, he says, this is what God says. This is what he wants them to hear. The God who builds a road right through the ocean, who carves a path through pounding waves, the God who summons horses and chariots and armies, they lie down and they can't get up again. They're snuffed out like so many candles. So he's, he's giving them a picture of the deliverance, the exodus that they went through. And he says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do for you. And he says, be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert rivers in the badlands, he says. You see, God's people are told here to to forget the tough struggle that, that it took them to become His people. So forget the pain that brought you into your identity in me. He purposed them to do amazing things. And He says, forget what others did to you along the way. Some of us need to hear this. He's, he's, he's actually making roads through the wilderness or, or through the, through the uh, pathway through the ocean, and we can't get past our past. And he's not saying just now, now let's all get up and pretend it didn't happen. He's saying deal with it properly. Deal with it in the right way. Deal with it in the whole way. But then don't go back there. It is not you. That's an old identity that was actually brought on outside of a life in me. God's new destiny is for us. He's doing a new thing. He has a new thing for them. He has a new thing for you, for us, through redemption and and healing and blessing and protection and even honoring us. He has a new thing for us. And the alternative of to for, forgetting about it, to you know, we got to deal with it and then and then leave it there. The alternative is either to live with it in sadness and depression and let that own you. Woe is me, or. Be like, you know what, I really don't need God. I can figure this out on my own. I got this. And I'll just say good luck with that. It ain't going to turn out well for you. And I know personally, because I have been there, I've I've done that. I've I've tried to figure it out on my own because I didn't want God to be the one because I wanted to be the one. But take that story of yours, whatever it is, and, and let it be the training program that you aced no matter what it took to ace it, maybe you're like, I really failed 17 times, but the 18th time you didn't, so you aced it. According to God, you aced it. So don't believe a lie from the enemy that, well, you failed 17 times, but the 18th, I'm done, done. So let that, let that story of yours be the training program that you aced and use it to go to others in need in need of your story, in need of your encouragement, in need of your your heart for them. Lead others. That's what I love about our mission statement is HCF is leading others, but HCF isn't a building or a person. It's not just a, a great group of elders, which we have. It's us. We are leading people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus. We laugh a lot here because joy is something that we just are and we have and it will not be quenched by stuff that happens around us. As much as I hate getting gas right now, I make myself laugh all the time because I'm like, Lord, this gas pump will not own my life in you. So praise God I can pay for this and sorry the kids can't eat today and I laugh, you know. But I will not let gas prices dictate my life. You cannot let, as horrible as it was this week in Uvalde, I cannot imagine. That can't dictate joy. As hard as it is, maybe you're looking forward and you're going, the elections in November scare me. 
Don't let them scare you. Have joy and tell people why we should vote the way we should vote. By the way, you cannot, as a Christ-following, Bible-believing person, vote for Mr. O'Rourke. I'm just saying that. I don't hate the man or despise the man. I don't. He needs Jesus. And I hope he finds Jesus. I think he'd be a really cool Jesus follower. But you cannot, as a Christian, based in this, vote for him. And if you have a problem with that, please just come and see me and sit with me. I will tell you all about it, starting with life, then marriage, then creation, and then a thousand other things. But, but don't let stuff scare you or try to steal your joy. Because you know what? The enemy will always try to steal your joy. Okay? Pray for our leaders. Pray for the leaders you disagree with because we're supposed to pray for them. Anyone can be saved. Pray for those who follow Jesus. Pray for those you like that believe in your, your, your stances politically but don't follow Jesus because they still need Jesus. And, and they all, following Jesus or not, can be guided by Jesus. So pray. I tell you what, you want joy to just flow out of you in this political season and life we live in? Be praying for people. Watch people who disagree with you make decisions that line up with Scripture, and then you'd be like, huh, <laughs> I, I'm, gonna laugh. I'm not going to laugh at, but I'm going to laugh, you know, right now. It's happy. Like, they don't even know why they voted the way they did for Jesus. Just pray for them to make Jesus' decisions and contend, contend, contend. Because who knows? Who knows? Nebuchadnezzar relented and followed God, or at least... Acknowledge the following. I can't, I still struggle with Nebuchadnezzar a little bit, but in spite of him, he made God decisions. You never know. Paul was murdering Christians and got saved. He murdered Christians for a living and he got saved, so anything can happen. But take that story of yours that you walk through and use it for others. You walk through it, make it be for something. Right? Make it be for, for shining out the, the message of Jesus. The, the clean slate God gave you as He set you free. That, that new start, that fresh start He gave you. Use that. Even after that crazy time you went through, tell people. Forgiveness that you worked through. It was really hard, but you went to the heart of it and you forgave in spite of it making a lot of sense. Tell that story. Being restored your own self or in relationship after, maybe after all that mess, it was unfair and weird and painful, but God did this as you just lived your life held open before Him. Tell that restoration story. People, we live in a broken world that says, you know what, when something's broken, just move on and be angry about it and never give them a chance again. Tell people your restoration stories. It'll blow their minds because the world can't do that. Only Jesus. Maybe you were betrayed or majorly hurt somehow and you chose to let Jesus heal you and not live in light of that betrayal or, or that pain and you tell that story to someone who's walking through something painful. Maybe they're going through a divorce and they're like, I can't believe he did this after all this time. I, I can't believe she chose this after all this time and it's this hurtful betrayal. And you tell the story of how God can dot, dot, dot in their life. I mean, look at Moses. He murders somebody out of anger, and there's the shame of it, and, and the fear of what might come, and he runs away, and he's being a shepherd on the backside of the desert. And God uses Moses to then shepherd a flock called Israel as they walk through the desert into that something new God had for them called the promised land. He took his story and he gave it to God. And part of it, Moses didn't even know he was giving it to God. He was just living faithful. Uh, and all of a sudden, God's like, I was never going to leave you out here in the desert, but I am going to take you to a desert so that I can take everyone to the promised land. Look at Joseph. He's one of my favorite stories. He's betrayed. He's lied about. He's imprisoned. He's lonely. What he went through made him the perfect person to think through how to properly care for people, an entire nation that he was put over eventually. Number two in charge of Egypt. All that he went through just prepared him for how to, how to lovingly care for them. Your pain 
or tough times as you walk through life makes you perfect for others. Lead people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus. You can do it. So what's God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? In Hebrews 13, the author of Hebrews is writing and he's giving us some practical things of, of how, to, uh, how to live this life, to, to, to love others and reach others, and, and even how to live this life as an example because we both do, we do things for people and then we also show Jesus to people. And here's some of the stuff he says in Hebrews 13. Stay on good terms with each other, held together by love. Be ready with a meal or a bed when it's needed. Extend hospitality. Care for those who are captive. Be the compassionate care to those who are hurting or abused. Live honorably and pure in your marriage. Because sometimes that's the thing that, that's all they need to see is that. And they're like, whoa, something's different. Don't be obsessed with getting more stuff. Be relaxed and live content with what you have, the author says. God promised you that he'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. You can live fearless no matter what. No one and nothing can get to you. Be matured and motivated by leaders in your church life. Paul, Peter, John, James, the author of Hebrews, they're all, they all say the same thing. Be a part of a church life, submit your life there, and do life with that church community. I like to be kind of a lone ranger. Then you're not following the Bible, just telling you. Be a part of a life-giving, life-bringing church that focuses on Jesus and stays true to the gospel and submit your life there. But there's hurting people there and they, they, you know, they, they hurt people and not everyone's perfect. I know, you're there too. Uh, but like we walk this stuff through and we're not expecting, don't expect perfection, expect to be perfected along the way. Don't be lured away from Jesus by trends or what the world dictates. God's grace is the key. And living out of grace is always better than being obsessed with rules. If we're true in our belief, coming to Jesus and becoming a part of his church ruins us for the ordinary. At least the way the world describes ordinary. People see that and they want that hopeful peace. And the reality is this is not our home. But we're supposed to get people to move from here to an eternal home. Because at the end of life, there's going to be two places people are. A place called hell that was created for Satan and his demons. Just them is what it was created for. And it's a Christless eternity, and it's horrible. I can't even fathom it. But that can be the place that humans can go to if they say no to Jesus before they die. But our life in living on mission is to tell people about Jesus and how much he loves them and wants them and his, his unconditional love and, and far-reaching grace so they can move their, their residents, even while they're alive, to heaven. Because we are temporary sojourners here. We are transients on this earth. And, and you know what? This earth can be so great at times. I mean, it was... Perfectly created at one point, and it was created by a, a wonderful, amazing creator God. But at the same time, it's temporary. And it's broken, and it's winding down. Heaven, that's the place to be, and the place to be going to. So we got to tell people, live on mission. That's why we love our mission, leading people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus. We take them, we're leading Outward focus for the sake of others. Because we're set, right? Those struggles that we successfully walk through as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit and, and we're encouraged by others doing this life with us as we live different from the world around us, that makes us uniquely qualified to empathize with the lost, to, to understand unbelievers and, and motivate us to go. Because outside of Jesus, they will not live eternally with Him. Lead people to discover their purpose and the joy of Jesus. There's so much awesomeness to learn in how they're uniquely made. That's, that's why they get to discover it. 
I can't make them you discover it or somebody lost discover it. That I can lead them there, but Jesus shows them as they discover what's for them. Each person, couple, family, all made for something amazing in Jesus. That's the purpose. And Jesus, and this life in Jesus, is the most fun, the happiest, the most amazingly joyful way to live. A constant celebration of so many things. That's the joy. All because of Jesus. We get to live in light of absolute assurance. So I love hope as it's written in the Bible. And is this defined by God who is hope? It is not some wispy, maybe dream. It's a sure foundation. It's absolute. It's concrete. And in that joyful assurance, that real joy, we see the designed God purpose that he has for each of us. So we have to remember those who haven't stepped into a relationship with Jesus. They haven't, they haven't started a relationship with Jesus, they're not saved yet. We've got to remember that they're not there yet. So we are the voices to take Jesus to them. When he left, he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit to live in you because if I stay, I can only go where my feet take me. And there's a whole planet. But if I go, the Holy Spirit comes and he lives in the life of every believer and then I'm everywhere. So we take the mission of Jesus to seek and save the lost to the lost. Others aren't living in the fullness of freedom that Jesus offers. The full life He offers, so take them. They might be believers, but they're just living a less than life. And you've got to remember that you know what it's like to live an abundant life. Perfect? Not yet. Being perfected? Absolutely. Full of joy? Nothing's going to stop it. And we do this together. So what's God saying to you? Who's God putting on your heart? I guarantee you, if someone came to mind, that's what the Holy Spirit's saying. But I didn't want it to be Him. (laughs) Oh, not them. Let somebody else go to them. If they came to mind, or He came to mind, or she came to mind, that's who you're called to. That's what God's saying to you. Maybe who God's saying to you. Or maybe there's a what. What's God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? Maybe you're here, or you're listening, and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. He says, come to me. Lay down your burdens. Lay down what you're hanging on to. Give me your life and I will give you my perfect life. I will give you eternity. But you have to say yes. I don't understand everything about Jesus. None of us ever do. But we're on a journey in this life together in community. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and you want to have a guarantee of salvation and eternity, this is your day. And what a cool thing in a few minutes to go into communion. And remember what he did for you. You are forgiven his blood on the cross. He gave his body in your place so that you could be made whole. You have that opportunity today. If you want to know Jesus, Romans 10 says, believe it in your heart, speak it out with your mouth, call the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. And then lordship happens as your disciple in relationship with him. But we have the opportunity and the commissioned command of Jesus to go. You have the absolute ability to lead people to discover the joy of Jesus for their purpose and the joy of Jesus. I want to read Psalm 1611. I'm going to ask you to stand, and then I'm going to pray. Psalm 1611 is our main passage for the mission that we have here at HCF. And David writes, you, he's pointing to Jesus, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. It's interesting because David's writing and he's pointing to the immediate benefits of knowing God here and now. Hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene as a human, he's he's pointing to the, the immediate benefits of following God and knowing Him, that purpose and joy, but he's also looking forward to the future hope that is Jesus. He's actually speaking to Jesus hundreds of years before he walked, and now speaking to us after Jesus has walked on this planet 2,000 plus years later or so. He's talking about that future hope of eternal life because of the resurrection of Jesus. Peter had a famous passage, a famous moment in Acts chapter 2 
where he quotes this, this passage David said, and he's, it's in his, his famous sermon, and he's, like, he's saying, hey, God has saved you for a purpose. Let's find out what it is. And know this, there are eternal pleasures and an absolute joy as you walk hand in hand with the living God who wants you in his family. And so Jesus says, go. Go. Love God. Out of the overflow of that, love others and live on mission. It's the great commandment and the great commission that we abide by and that we, we call our, you know, our kind of our mandate as a church. We love God, we love people, and we go. So who do you need to go to and share with? Who do you need to invite into life with Jesus or maybe into community life? Or what do you need to do right now to get yourself in that spot? As we go to a time of worship, the altars are going to be open. Maybe you just need to come up here and, and talk to Jesus uh, before we go to communion. And just say, Jesus, I hear you saying this, and I want to do that. You do that. Maybe you just do it where you are. It's okay. But the altars are open for you. But let's pray and let's worship him. And then we're going to take communion uh, after this song with Pastor Rusty. And, uh, and we're going to be people who live on mission for Jesus. God, I, I thank you for saving us. I thank you for giving us a purpose, giving us something brand new a new thing. You don't call us to languish in the old and, and, and fight and drudge our way through just to get there, but you give us a full and abundant life now because eternity is set for those of us who follow Jesus. So, so help us to live on mission, full of purpose, full of joy, all because of Jesus. God, whatever it is you're saying to each one of us or each couple or each family, would we hear you? And would we ask you, okay, what, what do we need to do about that, God? And step into that that you're calling us into. In your name we pray. Thank you for listening. For more sermons and full service replays, visit us online at hcfburnit.org. God bless and have a great week.